Amazing. Thank you, Ali, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Janet. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm coming to you today from the unceded and occupied lands of the Halkamalem and Squamish Nechen speaking people, colonial known, colonially known as Vancouver, and I am um, myself in East Ben. Um, thank you for those that have introduced yourselves into the chat. Please, if there's anything else you'd like to say, we'd love to hear from you. Seth and I are super thrilled to, to be with you today. Um, and I wanted to say we also want to hear from you. So yes, we do this work, but we also really believe in the collective intelligence um, of the group and know that there's a lot of knowledge resting within you, the participants and attendees today. So we'd love to hear from you as well. There'll be lots of points that we're going to sort of open up uh, opportunities for you to add thoughts. Um, share a story, ask a question, even disagree with something that we're saying. We really encourage your input. Put it in the chat or um, use the raised hand function, which is in the reactions. And Ali and Seth and I will keep an eye out for your for your raised hand to give you an opportunity. You can do that at any time. Or if you're more comfortable, wait to the end. We will be sharing our slides, so don't worry about it. What we're going to do is um, if we do have anybody drop additional things into the chat, what we'd like to do is add those and then we'll share out a completed version. So it's not just what we've brought to the table today, but also acknowledging your contributions to our presentation. And um, I just really want to say we're going to whip through, we're going to fire hose at you um, a lot of content today. Um, we're not going to go into detail on all the points that we've raised. It's impossible, but we are really happy to chat with you afterwards. And at the end of the slideshow, we've got our contact information. We'd love to hear from you and um, go into depth on, on anything that piqued your interest or, or things that we didn't touch on, but that you're, you're curious about. So Seth, do you want to say hi? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Janet. Hi, everyone. My name is Seth. I'm very, very happy to be here today. I'm the program manager for SFU Public Square, and I, too, am uh, joining from the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Um, I am actually in the west end of Vancouver, so into, into downtown. Uh, I also just wanted to say that my, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I am also very, very comfortable with the pronouns of they, so feel free, um, whatever you prefer. I am very happy to be here and just very excited to get to the content. So I also just wanted to quickly mention, you know, if there's anybody who would like our presentation as we go as well, I'm very happy to pass it into the chat, um, can access it, um, and then we'll also send the completed version afterwards. So if you'd like that, let me know. You can feel free to private message me if you would like as well. Um, I'll, I'll make sure it's in there for you. Thank you. And I'll pass it back to Janet. Awesome. Okay. And I forgot to mention, if somebody does share a story today during the course of our conversation, we just ask that we kind of respect confidentiality and sort of no details are taken outside of the space that this container that we're in together today. So a quick review of the agenda. These are kind of the five buckets that we're going to hit on today. Just really quickly, the context uh, that we that we ourselves are coming from in terms of our community engagement approach. Some of the big challenges to community engagement, some strategies to avoid them, starting with the why, the North Star of why you do community engagement. Seth is then going to dig into the what, uh, talking about formats and, uh, of, uh, of community engaged activities, and then dig into who has a voice and really kind of spend some time digging into some key components about accessibility, representation, diversity, things like that. So again, we're really touching quickly on things that could take days to talk, weeks to talk about. So, uh, you know, please, please feel free to um, reach out. So really quickly, sort of the, uh, the SHRC knowledge mobilization definition is the reciprocal and complementary flow and uptake of research knowledge between researchers, knowledge brokers, and knowledge users, both within and beyond academia, uh, such uh, in such a way that may benefit users and create positive impacts within Canada and or internationally. And the working definition that we're using today is the Carnegie classification of community engagement. So for those of you that don't know, in the United States, there's a classification system for post-secondary institutions that can that to be considered community engaged that is um, quite specific and there's pilot programs happening sort of around the world and SFU is leading the one here in Canada. This is their definition. The, the Canadian definition is probably gonna be tweaked upon some a little bit, but community engagement describes the collaboration between institutions of higher education and their larger communities for the mutually beneficial exchange of knowledge and resources in the context of partnership and reciprocity. It's important to note both these definitions talk about sort of this shared benefit, so this mutual beneficial piece. 
Um, the purpose of community engagement is the partnership of a college and university knowledge uh, of, uh, of college and university knowledge and resources with those of the public and private sectors to enrich scholarship, research, and creative activity, enhance curriculum, teaching, and learning, prepare educated, engaged citizens, strengthen democratic values and civic responsibility, address critical social issues, and contribute to the public good. So these, these ideas are related, but to me, knowledge mobilization fits uh, into the more broad definition of community engagement. And community engagement is not just about uh, the dissemination of research, or, uh, research and knowledge, but it's also about the sharing of university assets and resources overall with community. So that's, again, that shared benefit. So for those of you that are already working in the arena of community engaged research and scholarship, perhaps you've already co-designed a knowledge mobilization or community engagement strategy with community as part of your project. Um, for those of you that haven't worked in, in this way, perhaps you're just now thinking about how to move your research into the wider community. Either way, hopefully what we outline below um, and through the rest of our presentation will be useful to you. And again, just to get super specific, how Seth and I have understood our assignment today is to focus really on sort of event activity and planning as a specific uh, approach to community engagement with, with the acknowledgement that the praxis of community engagement is a much, much larger context, but we're, we're, we're giving you a little piece of the pie today, which is really kind of about the idea of programming community engagement. So some of the some of the key challenges and some strategies to avoid them. So just kind of starting with naming these things um, uh, right off the top. So in in uh, in the perfect world scenario versus the reality within which we're operating when we're we're creating community engagement programming, we have all the resources we need. We have to do deep, intentional, co-designed, in-depth, long-term community engagement, full of feedback loops and relationship building. In this world, there's no deadlines, there's no funding requirements, there's no publication dates, no shortage of bandwidth within your team or the community or communities you're working with or want to access, but we know that's just not real. In fact, we're constantly working within constraints and limitations, power dynamics and scenarios that impact our community engagement activities. So let's start by assuming we're all striving to do the best that we can and we have the best intentions. Set your bar high, but don't let perfection be the enemy of good and adopt a do no harm mentality with your community engagement activities. Let that be a fundamental principle and, and, and approach. We're all doing our best. So some of the biggest challenges that emerge that kind of get in the way of our attempts to seek that, that, that uh, you know, height of perfection, obviously number one is limited resources. Time, having the time to properly plan and uh, intentionally and properly plan and co-design. Funding, is there ever enough of that in any context? No. Um, capacity, you, your team, if you're lucky enough to have one and the community you're working with um, to actually be able to pull off what you wanna do while also being called to meet all the other goals and objectives of your research projects and your lives. Having the skill to execute a community engagement activity. It, this is actually, it's a practice. It's a, it, there's frameworks, there's um, a lot of stuff to, th uh, to think about and to plan for. Um, some of the other sort of roadblocks that we see that our partners, when we work with them, they run into, so a, sh a shortage of capacity around marketing and communications. So promotion uh, for participation, that can be graphic design, event copy, having an event right pay, like what a registration, all that sort of stuff. And all that, all those things you need to do, advertising to reach your audiences and get the word out to engage people to to um, attend your programming. Never underestimate uh, the strength and the need of good communications. Um, making your content interesting and accessible and, and ensuring diversity. Sometimes we're doing really great research that just like, how do I make this interesting to people outside of just sort of the key people that have been, that have been uh, involved in my research? Um, hosting an event that's engaging and approachable for participants, but it's not the same as things that we've seen before. So, you know, different subset of a different thing and how do you present that in a way that sort of engages and sparks in the imagination to bring people in. Um, finding, uh, oh, meeting the expectations of funders, community partners, institutions, peers. There's a lot of expectations around this work. We all, we all know this. Uh, finding and confirming a good facilitator or moderator, communication with panelists and speakers, indigenous knowledge holders, other folks that you want to have as part of your, your activities can, can take up a lot of time, can be, can be challenging. 
um, sourcing venues, like simple things like finding the venues, finding caterers, booking an AV crew if you need it, photography, like all those sort of things that are sort of those, adi- those are key important things, but again, eat into your time. Um, learning curve for the use of online technology. So this has been a big thing over the last couple of years as we've really had to move and do everything, all our community engagement online. This has been a big challenge, uh, but also opportunity um, for folks. But there's definitely risk and learning that happens in the, in the online space. And then, of course, we, we won't get into this today, but you all know about sort of political and social constraints around whatever uh, topic issues you may be working with that can pose some challenges for, for doing community engagement work. So um, if you can think of other challenges, and there definitely are some, this is just like our quick brainstorm dump, please go ahead and put them in the chat. We'd love to hear about some of the other challenges you've run into. We'll grab those, we'll add those to the list. Um, so take your time and, and, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. So here's some ideas about how to address some of these challenges. So for me, the top way to avoid a whole bunch of those challenges that I've listed above is, of course, <laughs> plan your community engagement activities as soon as is humanly possible. As soon as the idea that you are going to do community engagement is a glimmer in your eye, start thinking about it. Start putting time and energy into that. And because the longer the lead time, the better. It's deadline oriented work just because it has a, it has a set point of when it has to happen, which always it's like the train, the train that speeds up. But the lot more time you can give to it, it's always better. Um, and then I would say just as important, and, and this is the piece that I think people, it's obvious, but not, is partner, collaborate, build relationships also right from the get-go. Partner, collaborate with others who have community engagement and, and facilitation experience, capacity, and skill, like us, Public Square, other engagement professionals. Partner and collaborate with others who are representative of and have inroads and networks with the communities and audiences you're trying to reach. This is really important. You want to have a whole bunch of this, this, this and this, different groups of people. You don't know anyone from those groups. Find those trusted ambassadors, develop those relationships, and then they can help bring those people to the table. And you can then, you know, also develop relationships through those through those interactions. Um, don't always go to the usual suspects and continue to enforce the status quo. Too many times you see the same people on the same panels. We need to move beyond. Partner with people who have access to venues, um, AV, AV professionals, platforms, post-secondary institutions are great for that, There's but there's also other places. Um, and I can't stress this enough, seek help where you need it to meet your capacity demands. You don't need, you shouldn't have to figure out how to run a camera. Your job is to be a good researcher. It's not a good cameraman, not a good graphic designer. So ensure you have some money put aside in your budget for some outside support and expertise. Those things that are going to take up all your time that you don't need to worry about really outsource for those things again. And if you can through a partnership, if the event is public, Communicate broadly and often. Ask your networks to share. If it's public or private, develop a list of targeted outreach to make sure you're getting to the key stakeholders you want to reach and follow up. One email, one newsletter, one outreach likely is not going to do it. But if they've heard from you multiple times, the chances of them actually participating or getting bringing them to the table goes way, way up. Be creative. Think outside of the box. Don't be afraid to be innovative if your project allows for it. Like the, there's lots of room for creativity and community engagement work. And the more creative we can get, I would say, the better to help shake people out of their out of our constrained ways of thinking. Again, uh, obviously, make sure you have enough budget. Whatever you think your community engagement is going to cost, double or triple it. It's a shame to do all the great work and then not actually be able to do that, getting it out into the community, getting it seen, getting policy in the front of policymakers, all that sort of stuff. And then I would say another fundamental best practice is that you ensure that you deliver on what you promise. This is often where community engagement falls away and where we, we erode trust in people to participate in community engaged activities. Really, when it, especially when it comes to community, deliver on what you promised. So um, in the lead up, in the session, and in the follow up, whatever you've promised, make sure that that is a key piece of when you're wrapping up your project or whatever it is that you're, did I follow up on all those things? Did I fulfill all those promises? Really, really important. So another uh, another opportunity, if there's, uh, if you can think of ways that to address some of these key challenges, other ideas to build upon sort of some of these solutions, again, please drop them in the chat and we will grab them. Um, so for the rest of our presentation, we just wanted to say that we're, we're presenting this stuff in sort of a linear way, 
But each of these different facets and all the things that we're not going to get a chance to talk to are constantly sort of in impacting each other and will change and shape your engagement design as you go. That's okay. That's part of it. It's important. Um, you may come to an understanding or make a decision about one thing. You may be forced into a decision like this is the only venue that's available. It's not the one you wanted. Okay. It doesn't have the room set up you need. Okay. You just, right, continue to innovate, work through it shift things around, you can you can make it work. Um, so we've included a, a main outline of events, like a main elements that you need to be thinking about. And then the key really is just making sure that the align, you keep finding the alignment, do these things align, do these things align. I've had to switch this, what do I need to make sure that now this is aligned? Um, then we've had to make some really tough choices about what we go into in depth today in the short amount of time that we've had. Um, so we kind of tried to pick like a top, 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 most important things. And, and then again, happy to continue a discussion at another time. So um, this is for me, the best practice of community engagement, which is starting with the why. Why are you doing community engagement activities? Of course, you've got to fulfill your knowledge mobilization connections grant, but like really, like why are you doing this? What's the need? What agenda is being fulfilled by this work? What is it you hope to achieve with these with these efforts? What is the purpose, goals, and objectives you hope to achieve? It's the classic question is what does success look like? When this is done, when you've completed your community engagement activity and programming, you've accomplished X as a result. What's changed? Who's changed? What behavior is different? Who knows more about this? Really, it's like what, what has moved as a result of this community engagement work? Staying focused on this why question, crystal getting crystal and staying focused will help you all the other things fall into place for you in a much, much easier way. Let this be your North Star for your community engagement programming. Why are we doing this? Um, and then we have this laundry list of things that I'm going to just go over quickly and we're not going to be able to get to all these things. But like having an understanding of that why will help you determine answers to all these other things the engagement format that you're going to use, the tactics that you're going to use. And Seth's going to talk a little bit about this, but the why and the tactics, they're like the, the lock and the key to actually having successful community engagement and achieving your goals. Is the, is, are you co-designing this? That's a question you're going to ask in the why. Is, is, there, is there a capacity ask of the community that you're asking to participate? What's the depth? What's the scope? Is it confidential? Is it public? Where are you holding it? Is it online? Is it in person? Is it hybrid? When are you holding it? What time of day makes sense for the people that you want there? Is there catering? Who gets a voice? Who's invited? Who's who's got an opportunity to speak? Seth's going to talk a bit more about this because the who is also, I would say, one of the top most important things to be thinking about. How do you frame and describe the event and the issue that you're talking about and your perspective on it, right, that you're going to be bringing forward? Where and how do you promote? What's the accessibility level of the content and discussion? Sort of what's the literacy? Like, you know, what kind of language are you using? Are you using uh, a, whole, a whole bunch of definitions that people are maybe not going to understand? And what other accessibility measures are required? And Seth is going to touch up really on that as well. What information or data are you trying to gather and how you analyze that data? What's the follow up promised with participants? Make sure you deliver. What impact will the community engagement have on your research? Is this just a broadcasting out or is this actually, are you taking information back in? That's then you are going to be putting and filtering in and it's going to be changing and shaping um, what you're working on. Are you recording live broadcasting? How, what's the design of your evaluation methodology? How are you measuring for success around your community engagement? What support will you need? This is what I talked about, about the capacity. Do you need volunteers to help you run it? Do you need a facilitator? I would always say yes. Do you need a moderator? Do you need a Zoom host? Do you need a camera crew? All this sort of stuff. Um, and then consider your potential risks. Again, your political risks, your social capital risks, uh, you know, things that can go wrong during your event uh, or the lead up uh, to your event, which we've certainly had. And then obviously the financial investment, right? So community engagement, it's resource heavy. Let's, you know, done well, it's resource heavy. So let's just own that. Um, and then again, one more opportunity for engagement. If you think there's other considerations that we haven't listed and there are, feel free to drop them into the chat. We'll add them to the list. And uh, now I've never spoken so quickly. I'm going to pass this over to my partner, Seth. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, 
very excited to to be involved in this. And I know Janet's, you know, gone through a lot of really incredible stuff when it comes to the why. And I, I apologize, I missed a slide there. So I'm just going to skip through that. And we're going to start moving into uh, just what Janet was referring to, which is really the what. So we start thinking about your what. And for the purposes of today, um, we'll kind of call this the programs, maybe format or tactics, just like Janet's referred to before. And there are a ton of different ways to format an event or an activity and a huge selection of facilities facilitation engagement tactics and frameworks to choose from, but one of the most important considerations to be made about community engagement activity is the alignment between the goals and objectives and the format and the tactics. There must always be this kind of alignment between the why and the what. Uh, so you want to be using the right tools to help you achieve your event's purpose. This is really truly the art and the magic of community engagement is when those two things really align. And it's often the place where seeking support and working with an experienced community engagement facilitator may help you avoid any kind of missteps or save you a ton of time really in general in the long run. So as you can see on the slide, there's a, a large number of formats and this is just a, a number of things but uh, definitely not an all-inclusive list uh, feel free if again just like janet's done if you have other ideas to formats uh, please drop them in the chat i'd be happy to hear if you have other creative thoughts or ideas but this is just a few of them so things like keynote lectures panel discussions interviews q a's podcasts workshops town halls creative or arts-based initiatives, uh, large group gatherings, small groups and breakouts or discussion groups, uh, pop-up shops, lots of different interesting things that you can do to think about your format. And when you start to think about your format, you're going to have to also think a little bit more about what kind of framework you might use to engage in that format. So again, this is just another list of uh, lots of different things you can think of. Uh, it's not comprehensive. Um, if you have other frameworks that you're thinking of, you can often add, drop them in the chat as well. But these are just a few options or examples of different frameworks that you can use to help you kind of work through what it is that your format might be. So for different scenarios, you might use things like liberating structures frameworks, uh, deep democracy, art of hosting, world cafe, open space technology, appreciative inquiry, asset mapping, democracy, polling, surveys. Um, the last kind of few things are things like Kahoots, Mentimeter, Mural, Miro, Google Workspace, Slido, all those kinds of things. And a big part of the consideration between both your format and your framework is also what is that actual event that you're planning look like? So for instance, right now, I'm sure uh, many of you have experienced this, but during the pandemic, a lot of things shifted online. So we've moved and changed our formats and the ways that we do things based off of uh, where we're actually engaging and what kind of space that's taking place in. Uh, so right now we're engaging online. We're obviously using Zoom as a tool to help us um, our format is more presentation based and things look a little bit different than they might have two years ago uh, when we might have done this uh, in person and uh, had a chance to maybe meet each other, talk to each other about different things. It would look a little bit different and uh, there might be you know, a chance for, for different kinds of engagement that people are more comfortable with. So it's a little bit about frameworks. Um, and right now, sorry, just going to get that to go. We also wanted to talk a little bit about facilitation, which is really ultimately uh, one of the bedrocks of how you are going to be able to move forward in your community engagement events or activities, what that might look like. And the real role of a facilitator is um, someone who's able to hold space for the group, someone who's able to help you move through the work that you're hoping to do. Facilitation is truly a skill. It's also a service. So it's something that somebody is doing that is not invested in the outcomes um, other than really meeting the group's needs. So it's a, it's a neutral kind of space for somebody to be that person to move the conversation forward. Facilitation, and I welcome uh, if anybody else would like to, you know, drop their ideas on facilitation in the chat, please feel free, uh, and Janet as well, feel free to interrupt in any time if you have anything you'd like to add. But uh, otherwise, facilitation is really one of those incredible moments uh, that helps to move your event or what it is that you'd like to do forward. I'll also talk a little bit later about um, moderation, which is very related and similar to facilitation, but um, has a little bit of a different role, especially depending on the type of engagement or activity. And again, that format that you're hoping to do. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that later. All right. Um, the last thing that I really want to get into, uh, well, 
next thing is, is the who. So really, ultimately, uh, the why and the what are both going to really culminate in who is involved in your event. There's lots of different ways to think about the who. Uh, it's not just, you know, you as being the researcher. It's not just speakers. It's not just uh, panelists. It could also be your audience. It could be uh, the people that you're hoping to at least engage. Maybe you're not getting them in the door. Maybe you're getting them to, you know, research, uh, get into involved in your research in other ways. There's lots of different ways to think about the who. For me in particular, um, I really like to think about the who in terms of accessibility and meaningful inclusion. And now I, I put the meaningful here in italics because I think the meaningful piece of it uh, goes a little bit further than the idea of inclusion itself. And I just wanted to share maybe a little anecdote or a story of, of what it means to really be meaningfully included. So I, I thought of this idea or this scenario um, and bear with me, it's, it's a little bit silly, but it works. Um, so we all kind of know what it means to be included in something. Maybe, for instance, you've been invited to a dinner party or, or a themed party of sorts, and uh, the theme of the party is everything shrimp. Silly, I know. Um, but let's say you are invited to this party and you're going to join the party, but you actually have either an allergy to shrimp or maybe you um, uh, hold kosher observances and you're Jewish and you actually can't uh, partake in things like shellfish. You are included, you're, you're being asked to join this party, absolutely, but meaningful inclusion goes a step further to say that you are able to take part in all of the aspects of that particular engagement in a meaningful way. In this particular instance, if you're allergic to, to shrimp, you're not gonna be able to taste the shrimp. You're not gonna be able to take part in all of the shrimp goodness, um, if you like shrimp, that is, I don't know. But uh, for, for this particular instance, you know, meaningful inclusion goes in a, in a bit more beyond what it means to just include somebody and invite them to be there. So we can think about this when it comes to our community engagement events and activities as well. The, the idea behind it might not always be so black and white, um, but it's really important for us to start to think about um, how we can cater to other people's needs, how we can meaningfully include them in the work that we're doing and show up in a different way. So when I think about that, uh, you know, starting an event or starting what we do at the outset, we have to think about ways that we can include people um, when it comes to both accessibility and inclusion. And accessibility goes beyond uh, things like making sure that people's visual needs or their learning needs are met. Um, it's also about making sure that the way that we uh, maybe plan something is done in an equitable way equitable way um, in an equitable fashion. So we'll start to think about some of those things. And when we go through um, some of the ideas of the who, a lot of these things will become more clear. So a really good example of that is when it comes to speakers, for instance. Um, our speakers, they uh, you might be inviting folks to join as a speaker in your event or activity. And we really wanna think about things like representation. Representation truly matters when it comes to speakers. Um, I can give a really good example of this. Uh, one of our most recent events uh, that was the culmination of our 2021 Community Summit towards equity. Uh, we had a panel of four really, really quite incredible um, women of color speaking on the topic of climate justice. And I, I can remember very, very clearly and very vividly uh, the reactions to that particular event from some of the students who attended the event saying you know they had never been given the opportunity or never seen the type of representation on a panel that was speaking to them so powerfully about who they are and where they come to a topic um i i can really hear them hear their voices ringing in my head when it comes to just how excited they were and how much it impacted the way that they approached the topic and the subject matter so truly representation matters it's a little bit about uh you know the stakeholders that might be involved in your research but then it's also about who are the communities that you're trying to engage who are the people that you're truly trying to speak to and when it comes to speakers, another piece that we might need to think about is honorariums. Um, one of the best practices that we try to include is that speakers, uh, regardless of who they are, we like to pay them or compensate them for their time if it's possible. Um, there's lots of principles that go into this, uh, and I'll just touch on a couple of little things. But um, when it comes to folks who may be in vulnerable positions or might be facing precarity, uh, it's really, really important that you're also, you know, 
uh, offering them some kind of remuneration or consideration for their time as lived experience, as opposed to just compensating people for maybe uh, gained knowledge in areas like education or business or work experience. Um, part of that is really truly the lived experience of folks that you might be working with. So uh, it's really important to kind of make these considerations, especially when you're thinking about speakers that might be joining you uh, to talk about the topic or the uh, content that you're, you're hoping to. Next, I, I wanted to kind of touch a little bit more on that idea of moderation. So moderation is very, very different uh, in many ways from facilitation. Moderation, uh, when it comes to, let's say, maybe you're having a panel discussion or a conversation, can look very, very different from uh, knowledge mobilization and community engagement than it can for many other areas. Part of the reason for that is a good moderator truly holds that space. They're going to set the tone for what that space looks like and how people truly engage in that space. Uh, one of the important things to think about is really that moderator is also going to need to be somebody who is skilled and educated, maybe a little bit in the actual methods that you're using or the formats that you're using. So maybe you're using Zoom and you know and understand the different ways that people can interact in Zoom. Uh, they know that the chat's there. They're going to make reference to the chat. They're going to invite people to use the chat. Uh, maybe they're using another platform and they don't know and understand. It's going to be really hard to get folks to engage in the ways that you might want them to if that person who is maybe holding that space or doing the moderation doesn't quite understand um, how those platforms work. Another piece uh, to think about when it comes to the moderation is to understand kind of the process and be well versed in your why, right? So maybe that moderator is really looking to hold those spaces. That could be a big part of the why you're looking to create a space for people to actually engage. If that's not as important to you, it might not be such a, a big part of that moderation piece. Um, I think about really, really incredible skilled moderators and I think about um, the times that uh, we've had some really very fortunate uh, opportunities to work with people and just the way that they actually empower and make people feel like they can take part in spaces and are seen and heard in spaces. And I think that really goes back again to that idea of meaningful inclusion. So they're speaking to the reasons why you are doing what you're doing. Other few things that I wanna to touch on um, in many community engagement events and activities, it's really important uh, and you really just need to ask yourself if it's important to you in the work that you're doing to think about things like indigenous openers. We also modeled um, the idea of doing a territorial acknowledgement in this particular uh, instance as well. There's a big difference between inviting somebody from a community, uh, somebody who is indigenous to come and join your content and what you're trying to do. And so when I think about indigenous openers, it is um, something that is very intentional. They have a connection to what it is that you're doing. And maybe it's somebody you've developed a relationship with. Maybe it is someone who can speak to and provide um, an indigenous uh, viewpoint or knowledge on what it is that you're actually providing or doing. So the content that you're working through. Territory acknowledgements I see in a very different way being um, really the, the settler or somebody like myself's opportunity to say, I have a place to recognize um, what's going on with the unceded traditional territories, how that relates to the work that I do and how I come to any kind of engagements that I'm doing as well. So it's really more of an opportunity for us to think about what it means to decolonize um, our, our engagements and our events. Other things to think about, especially again, this going back to the moderation piece is uh, making sure you're providing housekeeping. We did the same thing in this particular uh, time as well. So in our presentation, Janet went through lots of really incredible pieces to make sure that you know and understand how you can engage in what it is that we're doing. Um, thinking about things like if you have closed captioning, making sure that people know that it's available for them. So you can make mention of that either in the chat or you can speak to it verbally. Uh, if you have things like language interpretation and translation, making sure that you're um, actually letting people know that those services are available. Um, one thing that Ali did a really great job of was letting people know that we are recording our session today. So um, it's really good to you know, give people that kind of transparent, honest view of this is how we're doing it. and This is why we're doing the things that we're doing. So that really kind of falls into uh, a bit more about who gets a voice. But one other thing that we really like to do or incorporate into our events and um, opportunities 
is something that we call community guidelines. And I've provided a resource at the bottom here for an organization working in Vancouver uh, community. If you've never heard of them, feel free to check them out. Uh, but they have a number of really incredible community guidelines. Um, and this is something that we like to provide in our events to help really kind of make that space or that container that we're trying to create a little bit more safe and a little bit more brave. Um, you can't make any space safe you can't make any space more brave. Uh, what you can do is just kind of provide those um, those added extra pieces to help to really make feel make people feel a little bit more empowered in the ways that they're doing things and why they're coming to things and engaging. So these are just a couple of examples, and I won't read them out um, of things that we like to provide to people to say these are the things that you need to uh, bring to the table when we're actually engaging with each other. Um, above all, things like zero tolerance for those who promote hate against others. So uh, if that does come up. Up, we have the option to say, sorry, um, not today. So there's there's lots of different ways to move through this. And I wish I had so much more time because uh, there's so much more to be said when it comes to um, holding space and really making people feel safer. But uh, without you know going into too, too much, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that for now. All right. And next piece I really just wanted to touch on as well was uh, thinking a little bit more about who gets a voice and uh, what that means for your audience. Um, there's lots of different tools that you can use to help make sure that your audience has a voice in the things that you're doing or is engaged in the ways that uh, you are hoping your format will go. So things like small group discussions, using the chat, using the Q&A, using poll features, especially if you have an online kind of component to your event, uh, using things like games. There's some really incredible uh, options for, for games in, in the online space. Uh, lots of different things that we'll be able to you know, share resources for and things like that later. You can use tools like Jamboards or whiteboards. And this is really gonna go back to those frameworks of how you go through uh, whatever it is that you're doing. These are the tools that you can use to, to really utilize those frameworks. Other things that I uh, wanted to touch on as well, we're just uh, in the kind of realm or area of accessibility, some really common barriers to engagement. So things to think about when it comes to why maybe somebody is not able to take part in what it is that you're doing. Um, one of the first things to think about is really language. Uh, when it comes to your research, are you using things like plain language to help people, maybe it's a public audience, better understand what it is that you're talking about? Are you avoiding the use of jargon or clearly explaining all the acronyms that you're going to be using? If you don't do those things, it can be a really quick, prohibitive way to say, oh, you aren't able to access the information that I'm trying to give you. The other kind of things that you can think about are maybe you need to use uh, language interpreters or offer language translation. If your content or the research that you're working in really uh, truly requires these things, it's a really great piece to be able to include. There is always a cost associated with these things. So think again about your budget, making sure that uh, you are able to provide these things. Um, other things are thinking about things like capacity. Maybe the communities that you're trying to reach and the audiences that you would really like to be there don't have the capacity to be there. Um, it's very possible. And if that's the case, I would start to think about maybe uh, being there being a possibility of you know, paying people for their option to be there that day. We've uh, done some really great opportunities in the past or had some really great engagements where uh, some folks needed that. And that was part of the actual design for the event was making sure that we had honorariums available for people to join uh, the event and take part. Uh, it's also just, again, another way of recognizing uh, their, their own lived experience and uh, their, their opportunity to engage in it. Other things to think about are time of day, date, format, technology, compensation. So much goes into all of these pieces and uh, I, I won't you know, touch on them too much more because I know we are running out of time and we wanna make sure that there's some space for questions, things like that. Uh, but really important to think about these things and we will be uh, eventually uh, very soon kind of thinking about um, a, an accessibility and inclusion guide that we'll be releasing uh, through SFU Public Square, as well as our SFU Public Square toolkit. I also wanted to draw your attention to um, just a checklist that the equity, uh, the equity, diversity, inclusion checklist from ceremonies and events. I did wanna say, you know, accessibility inclusion is much more than a checklist, absolutely, but they can be really, really useful tools to steer you in the right direction to say, you know what, you might not be able to remember all of these bits and pieces. You might not actually uh, know what you don't know. So these kinds of checklists can be a really great place to start to say, does this fit for what I'm trying to do? 
do I need to think about these things? Is this something that I need to bring into uh, my plan or whatever it is you might be trying to do? Uh, barriers to access really look different for everyone. It's not something that's kind of, a, again, a one-size-fits-all uh, op option. It's not something that you can always anticipate or predict. Um, like I said, if you, if you have the option, make sure you don't forget to ask. This is uh, kind of the, the number one principle that we always try to use, and this is just an example of something that we put on our website, that kind of thing. If it's uh, going out in an invitation, if you have anything that you might need that will help improve your access needs to whatever it is that you might be doing, we are gonna try and work, work around it and uh, you know do our best to provide it and make sure that uh, we open the conversation, open the door. Sometimes it's not gonna be possible. Sometimes it's gonna be difficult, but um, as long as you're open to that kind of relationship building aspect and having that conversation, uh, it's gonna make things much, much easier in the long run and help to make sure that you get uh, the audiences and the people that you want there. And like I said, coming soon, our SFU Public Square Toolkit, and then also our Guide to Accessibility and Meaningful Inclusion. Um, Janet, if you have anything you want to say about the toolkit, feel free, go ahead. But uh, otherwise, we just wanted to leave some time for questions as well. And I, again, greatly apologize that we had to speed through all of that. We're always open to you know further conversation um, and, and lots of other things. So. Thank you so much to uh, Seth and Janet. I really appreciated all that you've shared with us today and just the focus on the planning and the intentions and the why are you doing this work and alignments. There's just so many great ideas. I've been taking notes uh, as you've been speaking. Um, I do notice we have a, a question for you in, in the chat from Sarah. Uh, she has a question about marketing. Other than reinforcing messages a few times, as Janet mentioned, is another piece building a wide network with stakeholders? If so, how do you go about doing that? Uh, by the way, this is a testimony. You folks at Public Square do a great job marketing. I'm going to pass that along to our uh, marketing and comms people. They will they will love to hear that. Uh, we put a lot of time and energy into it. We think about it a lot. It's one of our biggest uh, investments um, that we do. Uh, so I'm trying to understand reinforcing messages a few times, another piece, building a wide network with stakeholders. I was, yeah, trying to get at that a little bit and Seth jump in as well is like, um, for the work that we do, we actually like research and create a targeted outreach list, right? So we've got a list of the people we want to make sure that we're getting to, we find email addresses, we find Twitter handles, all that sort of stuff. Um, Obviously, the number one way is to build relationship. You know, if that's possible, the more relationship with stakeholders you can build and you do that through the research work, you also, that's a huge part of community engagement is building those relationships, building and maintaining relationships. So you do another piece of work a little bit later on, you've built a relationship already with these people last time. It's much easier to come to come back and, and re-engage them. Um, but I think, yeah, this is, if it's about marketing, it's really about getting people there. So um, there's a rule like somebody needs to see something nine times before they act on it. So if they see it on Facebook and they see it on Twitter and they see it on LinkedIn and they see it in the Globe and Mail and they see it on their friend's feed and they all, you know, all that sort of stuff like that, all of those things combined, which you don't always very rarely do you have the resources to do all those things, but that's also really helpful. Uh, they get it in a newsletter, the newsletter gets forwarded to them from their friend and they're like, oh, you're going, you're going, they see it on Facebook, on a, an event. Um, it's really just trying to get, again, if it's like a big, broad public reach that you're trying to do, like where are the places that you can get it, that you can get as many eyes on it more than once. Um, but yeah, like relationships is is fundamentally the top, top, top piece. Um, and usually that's done in a way that's reciprocal, right? You're going to their events too, right? So you, you're, you're, you're kind of doing that whole thing. I used to spend 50% of my time was my events and 50% of my time was other people's events um that that were our our partners and and uh our collaborators go ahead Seth the only other thing that I was going to say is that I think it really also falls back to um what you were talking about earlier Janet with uh, you know building trust with the community I think being very clear about what it is that you're asking somebody to come to like these people are taking time out of their day uh to to attend something that you're hoping to plan right so uh being as open transparent honest about what it is that's like actually going to happen at your event is really quite important and making sure that you hold that space again for people to do the things you've asked them to do is going to be extremely important. And I think um, 
that often, at least for us, is what I've seen uh, brings people back again and again, too. So they come back to the conversation. It might be in a different way. They might, you know, reach out over email or something like that. It might not be that they come to every one of our events, but they uh, are open to and excited to have further conversations with us um, through that kind of trust building and, and transparency. So. Thanks so much. To you yeah, both. if that yeah, if that doesn't answer your question, Sarah, feel free to continue to turn your mic on. You know, happy to happy to add more, happy to chat afterwards. Seth, where's our slide with our um, contact info? There you go. Reach out. Happy to chat. Awesome. So I am saying we're we're right on time. Um, but maybe if there's one person on the line who does have a question they haven't had a chance to ask yet, we could do one more before we wrap things up. So you can unmute and speak your question, uh, or you can pop it in the chat and just give ourselves just a little bit of a moment uh, in case there's others on the line. I just want to, uh, while people are thinking about that, say I love the um, thinking about the work and the contribution of not only the organizer and the presenters, but also the participants. And framing that in your planning can really address so many things. So I love that, that framing, thanks. That collective intelligence, the lived, the lived knowledge, lived experience, yeah. Yeah, they're making, uh, by being there, they are, they are making a contribution Correct. to your work. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, speaking of asking people to do things, um, I hope <laughs> nice that <segue. laughs> I put two links there. I hope you can see that there are two. Uh, one is to uh, our our uh, event evaluation survey, which we'll also send in an email along with the the slides. Um, and then the the first uh, link there is just a link to our other workshops. And just in case you wanted to to check those out now that you've had this experience and uh, thinking again, putting into action Seth's suggestion and Janet's suggestion of, um, you know, these are, these are relationships we're building and uh, so that we have return customers. So please return. <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, looks like we're, we don't have any further questions at this time. So folks on the line, Thank you so much for joining us today. You can see you have uh, Janet and Seth's email address and contact info on that slide. So do reach out either to, to them or to Lupin and I if you have questions about general knowledge mobilization stuff, things that are happening. Just wanna take one more moment to thank Janet and Seth so much for joining us today. Uh, such a wonderful, wonderful talk and a whirlwind, but so much great information uh, that was shared.